WBOB-X Fruit Cove, WBOB. Ladies and gentlemen, it is now time for the Elder Law Hour with Emily Hicks. I'm Emily Hicks, and you're listening to the Elder Law Hour, where we're offering insights and solutions for today's seniors so you can age with confidence. Today, I have an exciting topic to discuss that could greatly benefit those with aging parents who are aging in place at home. Now, we all know that managing the health and well-being of aging parents can be a challenge, especially when it comes to communication between the family members. But fear not, because there is an app for that now. So there's a new app that might just be the solution that you're looking for, because according to recent studies, over 75% of adults want to continue living in their home as they grow older. However, there's often been a significant gap in communication and information sharing between family members, and that can lead to a lot of important details getting lost in the shuffle. So recognizing this issue, an assistant professor, Tina Satarangani from NYU College of Nursing, saw an opportunity to bridge the gap using technology. After years of research and development, the professor has created a groundbreaking new smartphone app, and it's called CareMobi. This is a free app and it aims to connect caregivers and healthcare providers. Now, it allows users to log essential information such as medication details, vital signs, appointments, meals, sleep patterns, and more, and that can be shared with their care team. The professor explains, keeping better track of day-to-day health information can help us nip emerging problems in the bud. Our goal is to help people keep people out of hospitals and emergency rooms by improving communication and supporting caregivers as effective advocates through data and shared clinical decision-making. So what exactly is CareMovi? Well, it's a practical and user-friendly smartphone app that's designed to connect the caregivers at home with perhaps the adult daycare program staff or the medical providers. The app's primary objective is to get everyone on the same team so that they can work together seamlessly. It's available for free to anyone who wishes to use it. And one of the app's key benefits is that it allows users to log in all of the recent health information like blood pressure or pain levels and eating habits. And then that data can easily be accessed during a medical visit, perhaps, or um, to provide a comprehensive overview of the individual's health. Now, This is going to share real-time information with the entire care team. And by tracking this, everyone involved can identify changes and trends and potentially spot any issues before they escalate. So currently, CareMobi is in its beta version and it's available to all users for free. However, the creators are also conducting a study on its use in adult daycare centers, and that's serving as the primary source of their research. So if you have aging parents who are aging in place at home, the Care Mobi app may be a good solution for you. I think this is a great tool, and I'm going to start recommending it to anyone who is a caregiver at home. I've actually downloaded the app, and I've taken a look at what all it can do, and it's great. I know firsthand some of the challenges of family caregiving is that you can't keep up with all of the appointments and the medication changes, the doctor's recommendations, new symptoms that are happening and everything that's going on with your loved one because you're often sharing these duties with other family members. You know, for instance, sometimes I would take my mother to her doctor's appointment while my sister was doing something else. And so this is a nice way that you can manage all of it from one place and stay up to date and informed which is also really nice for those family members that live far away, but they still want to be in the loop as to what's going on. So I look forward to seeing how this works out for families, and I hope this is helpful for those of you out there who have aging family members at home. We have a great show for you today. My guest is Josh Schultz, who is a CPA and a forensic accountant, and he's also the president of Schultz CPA. And Josh, like I said, specializes in forensic accounting, and he is an expert in investigating fraud, which is what we're going to talk about today, um, especially fraud involving elders. Um, there is a rampant amount of elder fraud that is happening now in our communities, and that's what we want to focus on today. So, Josh, thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Emily. I'm really happy to be here, and I'm glad somebody wants to listen to me talk about, you know, 
uh, a fraud. Uh, usually it's uh, <laughs> I know. not necessarily a happy to topic to talk about, right? Listen, we don't cover happy topics on this show. We only, <laughs> this is a, this is real time uh, problems here that seniors are facing. So we really, uh, this is a great topic. Like I, I told you before, I am really excited about um, discussing this because there is something like, I don't know how much billions of dollars that are stolen from seniors every year. It's just absolutely just amazing how much money is being lost um, with these scams and these fraudsters that are um, targeting our seniors today. So, but first let's start with you. So how did you come into this industry? Oh, that's a great question. Um, you know, like anyone in college, I think I was trying to figure out what I wanted to be. Um, wanted to be a lawyer. Somebody talked me into getting an accounting degree before I went to law school. And so you dodged that bullet. I dodged that bullet. I dodged, that bullet. <laughs> I dodged that bullet, but, uh, uh, you know, went in, uh, got a master's degree at Florida Atlantic University in forensic accounting and started really, it was interesting. It was, you know, investigating fraud and then the litigation support aspect. Uh, you know, I, I feel lucky me and my team, we get to do, we're not preparing tax returns or, you know, doing audits of financial statements. We, uh, are valuing businesses for, you know, transfers or disputes in litigation, assisting, uh, business owners or litigants in, in a plethora of things involving economic damages, forensic investigations, valuations of businesses and tangible assets. So um, it was lucky to get here. But what initially drew me was the fraud aspect of it. And so, you know, I, I tell everyone at the heart of this, I'm a fraud auditor. Um, right. And for as long as I've been doing this, which is, you know, approximately closing in on 20 years, um, you brought up a stat, 5% of uh, company revenues are lost annually from fraud. That That's has amazing. been a, a statistic that has held constant since 2008. I know that um, I'm a certified fraud examiner and I'm a member of the Association of Certified Fraud Examiners. So yeah. when you talk about the amount of money that companies lose or our economy loses to fraud, um, it's really eye opening, right? Um, so yes. that's what initially drew this to me was the, I think the excitement of investigations and, you know, doing those, that type of work and seeing how that all came together. You know, when you're thinking about what do I really want to do with my life? That sounded exciting. It, it, you know, it is exciting. Um, when you are involved in those things as, to, as well. Yeah, I could see that. It, it would be really interesting to do the investigations, keeping everybody honest, making sure everything is what they say it is, basically, right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, uh, to be an accountant and use those skills, but then, you know, I've trained in interrogation techniques, but knowing how to question and knowing what questions to ask or knowing what to ask for. All um, right. You just made those me nervous. Are fun. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you know, those are fun, but after doing this for 20 years, you know, the real deterrent to fraud is education. That's the one thing, because right. as much as the investigations can be fun, the fact of the matter is what's done is done at that point. That that fraud occurred, that money, that damage is done. Um, yes. And I think what a lot of people and. I know it from practice, Emily, and I, I'm glad we're talking about this today, is it's very hard to get your money back once it's gone. Right. Not like it's not hard to find it, but is it still there? Does it still exist? I know. And, and, if, that's, and then in what form? Because that's somebody might have spent it on a bunch of who knows what. And, you know, now that cash ain't exactly what you thought it was. Right. And, I'm, you know with real estate transactions especially that it's such a big liability these days with the wire fraud because you'll be getting sure. emails saying oh here wire this to my account and it'll be from that person and there's a uh, it's so easy to do and i've had a lot i mean we've seen a ton of of that in the past few years but once the money is gone it's gone and it doesn't come back and that's what people don't understand is it's and just then the world it's like we live into and in the world we live in today with electronic transactions and just me taking my phone and 
holding it up to something and we're transacting, the risk of fraud is just that much more prevalent, right? And Crazy. that's why you're seeing more and more stories, um, specifically, you know, for individuals, I, I think yeah. is where I'm seeing that start to hit. And, you know, a part of the reason that we're talking about the elder fraud, and I hate the term elders, right? Because right. that changes depending on, you know, what year we're in. 1980, an elder is different than 2020 type of elder. Sure. But the fact is, you know, I think anyone that's near or at retirement kind of fits into that. And I'll tell you why. You've accumulated a lot of your assets and net worth at that point in time. Yeah. You become a real target for people. Absolutely. Yeah. Unfortunately, that that's the case. And the downside of that, too, is when you play into diminished capacity, you know, when, um, you know, unfortunately, what we're seeing so much more of with my clients and in the elder, quote unquote, mm -hmm. community is um, are people that are losing you know, cognitive, um, that are having yeah. cognitive problems and cognitive impairment. And I read that they are, you know, obviously they're much more likely to be, to go for these types of things, but it's not just them, right? I mean, so let's get into, um, what you believe, you know, seniors need to know. We'll call them seniors instead of elders. How about that? And what seniors need to know about elder fraud? What types of examples are we seeing out there for the individual? Yeah, you brought up a good one. The email scams, um, they're just getting better and better at it, right? And um, the ability for fraudsters or outside perpetrators to mask their email, the ability for them to appear as a cousin, friend, family member, and to ask you for a check written somewhere or to ask for a certain piece of information yeah. is extremely it's just better than it was um it's something that even me in running my own business i have to be cognizant of i've been Absolutely. It, i've been it's been attempted on me and i go oh my goodness like I know. you know and let me explain something to everyone these fraudsters right are not looking to wipe you out in one false swoop that's not smart. Let's keep the faucet running. So what I explain to people is the damage of fraud is like a dam. When you look at a dam that's built, right? Everyone always reads the news stories of Enron or whatever is in there, right? Or the, you know, the, the school bookkeeper who stole $2 million. Yeah. Well, that's a big hole in that dam. But at most frauds, and the Federal Trade Commission just published their top five frauds of 2022, and most of them, those, those were all consumer-related fraud. They all talked about email. Most of them talked about some sort of online information sharing scam. But my point is, if you look at the median loss on those, Emily, mm -hmm. it was like 1,000, 500, 700. But now you multiply all those little holes in that dam. And it equated to billions of dollars of economic loss. Right. And that's a smart thing for those fraudsters to do because absolutely, the cops, what are you going to do? Call the cops about 500 bucks? Okay, they'll get right back to it. Exactly. Right? Yeah. And, and it your bank, they get these calls nonstop and for much, much larger amounts. And I think when they start targeting people, you go, oh, my God, am I going to spend the next two days of my life trying to track down $500, right? right. Because yeah. obviously $500, you were okay enough to give it up in that transaction. It's obviously not like, you know, obviously there's always the scam of please give me your bank routing number and everyone hears about the bank accounts being wiped out. But it's not like that. It's committing to a $50 charge and it, next thing you know, it's a recurring charge for some donation you think what it is but it's just a 50 dollars charge that, that's monthly cash flow frauds it's the business of fraud um, absolutely and i actually had a client um we discovered a fraudulent uh charge that was recurring on her account um just recently and the the only reason i think that it came to her attention is because we were trying to get her husband qualified for medicaid and it actually was an issue for us because then we had to 
you know, explain to the Department of Children and Families, hey, this isn't some, you know, thing that he's spending money on. This is actually a fraudster that has somehow gotten their information and has been uh, repeatedly, you know, and it's those little charges, right? I think it was only 30 or $40 a month. So it was only. flying under the radar. And yeah. you don't really notice, you know, something that small like, drips, um, you know, yeah. again, back to the ACFE, the median length of a fraud within a business. This is occupational fraud, but I still think it applies to some regret. Sure. Some extent is 18 months. Oh, so these wow. frauds happen for 18 months Ooh. before they are uncovered. I can tell you from personal experiences in practice, in investigations, it, that number holds true. Um, and a lot of the times these happens, and I don't know if you or the audience aware is it's something in my world we call poor internal controls, right? And an internal that, control yeah. is just what's my check and balance in place. And, you know, a point I, I think that every, all your listeners need to know is, so these frauds have become more uh, exotic. They've gotten better. Uh, they're definitely much more technologically oriented. But our internal controls, our toolbox for that, have not necessarily kept up with that. They're still yeah. somewhat basic, but they're basic for a purpose, right? You should look at your bank statement every month, whether you're a business owner or you're just a consumer at home. Right. What are these charges? Um, and I can't tell you how many times, Emily, I sit down with somebody who's been impacted by fraud and I go, did you check your bank statements monthly? No. If you would have done that, we would have found this immediately. Okay. Yeah. Um, here's another thing that I tell people, you know, you don't have to do something electronically. I still have checkbooks. I still prefer paper trails. Mm -hmm. My father, who is about to turn 72, will not commit to credit cards and additional debit cards. Yes. And he was always like that. Now I say this about a year ago, he was at the bank. They wanted him to do something. Should I open up these other accounts? 10 years ago, he probably would have said no. What I do notice is seniors are looking for people to trust, right? Right. Um, and that goes into the other aspect of this is when you look at who is being impacted by this, you know, a lot of the times it's people masking themselves as someone as a person of trust. Sure. So always be aware of that. But back to the controls aspect of it is don't sign up for it, right? Like a lot of the frauds we see are just very common sense. Don't put your credit card information out there. You right. do not need to have five different. If you start setting up different credit card accounts you're, and doing these online, you're just putting your information more and more out there. Um, right. I, I just tell people nowadays, I think it's, you need to be just much, much more astute of your own finances. Now, you know, Emily, when you get into situations like I'm sure you see where cognitive decline and people are looking for trust. Yes. That's a major hole, right? Yeah. I, I mean, that's where hopefully family members are in an ability to recognize those types of things. So if there's family members listening and you're starting to see some of these things, it's time for you to take an active role, right? Absolutely. Yeah. And that's where, you know, it's really key to have someone looking out for you if you can't look out for yourself anymore. And, you know, the reality is there, you have to be you know, on the lookout for these so-called family friends that come into play and they come in at a, you know, usually pretty opportune moment when there is a little bit of decline, you know, cognitively, there is um, some vulnerability, I guess, you know, we should say, and that that person comes in and now all of a sudden, oh, I want Josh to be my power of attorney instead of my two daughters, you know, and things like that. So as attorneys, I mean, we certainly... Um, you know, are on the lookout for that constantly. I mean, you really have yeah. to understand the family dynamic and understand what's going on. Unfortunately, um, a lot of times the family members cannot be the most uh, trusted. I, I did read. Uh, I've seen that. Yeah. yeah. I read the other day that most of the um, 
the fraud and, and I know we're talking about online and stuff like that, but a lot of times what is happening is actually a result of the family member taking monies from the seniors. So, and, and I see a lot more of that and those are the big numbers. So, yeah. you know, it, it, for your audience, I'm a student of fraud and um, there was actually a professor at BYU, Dr. Joseph Wells um, and the ACFE, you can go online and they have tons of resources for this, but Dr. Wells worked with, um, it, it was born out of the FBI when they started to look at white collar fraud. There were some things that they had found in those investigations called the fraud triangle. And they mm -hmm. found that in these types of situations, there's usually three things prevalent. Number one is the fraudster has some sort of pressure necessarily involved. This is what's making them do that, right? Mm -hmm. um, financial pressure, gambling, addiction, um, behavioral issues. Um, not all pressures are bad. I I investigated one that was a two and a half million dollar fraud and the woman stole it to pay for a uh, surgery for a family member. Oh, wow. So pressures. Yeah. When I hear about the economy, I know what's happening out there right now. Okay. Yeah. Um, the other aspect is rationalization. And, and, you know, Emily, you hit on that, especially with family members. It, it becomes a very real thing when one sibling has control and, well, I'm here. So that extra hundred or that extra whatever, that's due to me. And you have probably have tons of stories you can talk about that. But there's a rationalization aspect of it. And, and there is those all make sense after the fact but then there's the third leg to that stool and i think that's the most important leg in, in every fraud there's an opportunity to commit right so in a business you either left the door open to the warehouse or whatever and, and, and so yeah. fraudsters look for that opportunity is my point and you need to be aware of where your vulnerabilities exist. We talked about that, about the online, but I yeah. definitely think you're bringing up some good points about internally, right? Like, is the, is the nice woman or is, is this nice gentleman who's helping so and so really looking out for their best interests? Uh, you know, right. those cases can come up from time to time and, and, Listen, most of the time you're not hiring somebody like me. It's, it's you're pennies on it's not pennies on the dollar for recovery in these types of instances. So that's mm -hmm. where education is so important. Yeah. So what are the first signs if if someone, let's say an individual is being scammed um online and they don't really they don't even know it yet, what are the first signs that may come up for them? I mean, obviously checking the bank account um you know there's a lot of proactive things you can do right make sure i always tell people too just as a side note to that um when it, it's really great if you can simplify um if you can maybe not have five or six i see some people that have a lot of bank accounts and i don't oh, really know yes. why they have so many i so, don't either yeah I, i'm always saying you know let's let's try to simplify can you get away with one can you get away with yeah two? You know, let's keep I, it easy so that we can actually, um, you know, determine if something's going on without having a, a huge amount of work on our hands. Um, but, you know, what other things should maybe family members, you know, be aware of? Like I, I mentioned the new people coming in, but how, you know, I guess my my fear is that if you have a senior that is active in an, in online communities, okay, because I, I have I've read that online communities are just, this is where people start, you know, the fraudsters will really start to target people because, you know, and I mentioned this before in other programs, you know, there's a lot of isolation as a senior, especially, you know, post COVID there's um, you know, you're not as um, active in the community. You're not yeah. as mobile as you used to yeah. be. So a lot of people do turn to online communities. So how can one protect themselves um, in that instance? Do you think? I think that, you know, yeah, I, I think, look, what we're talking about today is known risks out there on the Internet. Um, but yet we still see people falling victim to that. Right. The only reason I can think about that is there's probably some pressures or rationalization within that person's head to that. 
Yeah. But we need to be aware of the fact that uh, I can't tell you every fraud that's going to happen. I can promise you that they're going to come up with new and better frauds, right? But to yeah. your point, Emily, people need to just be cognizant of what it is they're doing and understanding the risk. You're right. Being online and creating an online persona has some thrills with that, I guess, that people get. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> sounds like you're not want to be on a golf posting course. your lunch every day on Instagram. <laughs> you know what? I've gotten rid of Instagram and I've gotten rid of Facebook over the last year because um, of all the the uh, psychological uh, impact that I'm hearing about that. Uh, yes. You know, but that's a whole different story. But that's I a do different see, story. But but I do see how people get drawn into Facebook. I have absolutely. children. And I see how social media draws that in. And it creates an opportunity, right, for fraudsters, right? Oh, a and huge opportunity. I mean, I could if I, I wish I could sit here business. and tell people that there was a way that I could say that it'll stop, but there's not, right? I I, I think when you're looking at retail scams, right, where you're putting down a debit card or you're passing along some what we call PII, personally identifiable information. That's what the banking term of it. And, you know, that's your name, your street address. Um, that can be your, um, you know, an EIN number if you have a business or had a business, social security number. Well, you start putting bits and pieces of that out there. There's more data out there than people probably realize about themselves. I yeah. think that, you know, some of us are becoming recognizing that, hence why I don't see, you know, the value in me keeping in touch with somebody I haven't seen in 35 years. But I do see some risk out there. And you're bringing up the pressures that people have pressure in the fact that they're socially isolated. I, I, and you're bringing up the red flags. Yeah. I think, you know, when you start to see people that are socially isolated then and they're on the Internet, people are tracking those things. The Internet's scary in that you can be tracked and all that. But the Internet is not the only thing. Yeah. Um, I, I don't want people to think that the, the Internet's the only thing. Um, from personal history, just in practice, I used to, I grew up personally and professionally in South Florida. I dealt with Ponzi schemes several times. I've been in North Florida now about 10 years. Rarely, if ever. However, over the last 24 months post COVID, simultaneously when Northeast Florida has seen a population boom, simultaneously when a good, a good amount of that population boom, a segment of that population boom, at least appears to be from the outside. Um, sure. People of greater than 55 years who are not seniors, but maybe closing in on that senior um, side of that type of thing. Um, we're seeing, or at least I'm seeing, right, real estate scams. And it's oh, not, just, oh, it, not just like, you know, wire fraud transaction kind of stuff. I've seen Ponzi schemes. People are looking into... I'm newly retired. Oh, I can take an extra 10 grand and so-and-so knows a guy and we're going to put it into a fund and we're going to invest it into something. Right. And guess what? Your 10, 10 grand is gone. And yeah. I've seen a hundred grand and I've seen seven figures. Um, and you know, we've talked about the materiality of fraud, but that's something that I didn't think I would be seeing in Northeast Florida. But I'm seeing more of is some Ponzi scheme type of things and yeah. real estate scams have become a big part of that. I think a lot of that has to do with some of the concerns, particularly baby boomers are having with how much of my portfolio is in, you know, the private stock market. Sure. Real estate looks good right now, too. Right. Like, yeah. It's a hedge against dude. inflation. That's what everyone you know, that's the big um you know, selling point for real estate. Sure. And if you can't buy an entire house by yourself and I with so-and-so lion capital investments, oh, he's got a car, he's got a website and, you know, all those things can come up and draw up some paperwork and I can get in the door with you and your wife and I can tell you that you don't need to buy this house outright. You can be a part of it. You can invest into it. You know, you're sitting there and going, Josh, that's the oldest trick in the book. Is it? Because 
one thing I do know about fraudsters is they are some of the most believable per- people in the world. They yeah. don't necessarily believe what they are doing at that point is wrong. They really believe they're going to do that big investment, but they're just not astute business people. And the next thing you know, your investment money is actually paying their mortgage and grocery bill. They didn't, you know, because they got to take their management fee or something like that. So right. those types of investments that are masked with so-and-so went to such and such college, um, you know, with my background and credentials, I, I that's a concern for me. There is a lot of people that are coming out of the woodwork, not just here, but, you know, online. And they're saying that they are a financial or an investment professional and they don't have any qualifications. They don't have credentials or licenses. And but they're willing to show these people the time of day enough and they can take 50 grand and run away with that thing. And. Maybe they didn't, it's just a bad, you know, at what point in time, Emily, and you're a lawyer and, and, you know, we talked about this and at what point in time does a mistake become fraud? Right. Yeah. I mean, it's a, it's a great question. You know, even people with good intentions, you know, can, I, I saw this a lot a few years ago, um, with a group that, and I, (laughs) I, uh, I hesitate to say because it's a, it's a Christian group and it was so disheartening to me because I really felt like they, um, there were a couple of people involved that really, um, preyed on the fact that it was a religious, you know, community and they really gained a lot of trust, um, through, you know, that association and had just, I mean, ended up getting um hundreds of thousands of dollars um from mm-hmm. some people that they invested in their real estate um homeowner contracts. associations and religious organizations are calls that i field quite a bit from yeah because they usually uh, homeowner associations in particularly in south florida there's a lot of money at stake there and you have unqualified people looking at that checkbook Right. Um, oh, interesting. I didn't think yeah. about it. So HOAs are something that um, there's a you see a lot of. OK, well, that's interesting. And just misappropriation and stuff like of that nature. Sure. Um, I just think that, you know, seniors are going to continue to be at the heightened side of the risk of fraud. They hold the most assets and on the technological side, you know, the, that's just so rampant. But that's not the only area. Um I right. think, you know, you need to be very, very cautious of where it is you're putting your money on sure. a go forward basis. If, if it does sound too good to be true, it usually it, it is. So, you know, there's, there's different types of fraud, Emily, right? Uh, like yeah. there's, I'm getting attacked and somebody's taking somebody out of my account. And then there's, you've been bamboozled. Mm-hmm. Um, and being bamboozled is much, much more common. Um, yeah, I read um, I read an article about I, I want to say this man was in Canada, but I'm not quite sure. But he was defrauded of maybe it was like one point five million dollars or something like that through like a cryptocurrency scheme. So I think, you know, if as a, you know, 40 year old today, I find crypto and even you know speaking to real estate there are legitimate companies out there like roofstock for instance where you can invest you know certain amounts of money um you don't have to buy an entire house but you you know they put it into a pool and and you know all of that just kind of like you were talking about there are you know places that do that that are are not you know necessarily defrauding you but as a senior, how confusing must this be with all of this technology? I mean, with crypto, I mean, I find it confusing, you know, I, I not confusing. Here's as another what it scam is, but... for you. Yeah. I think yeah. here's another scam and they call it grandparent scams. Oh, so what gosh. they'll do is they will mask that they are your loving granddaughter who's off at the university of Tampa and has a problem and they can right. do it through email. They can do it with voice recognition software. Oh my. And yeah. And then they'll, Oh, don't worry, grandpa. Don't worry, grandma. I'll text you the code and you can Venmo it. 
Oh no. Or you can zell it to me. Oh, that's a on real the scam. Yeah. And yeah. you know, 20 bucks, 50 bucks, and maybe they'll do it like a few times till finally they talk to, you know, little Susie and Susie, are, is everything okay? Grandpa, what are you talking about? So that's a real scam. Yeah. You know, romance scams. We talked about that in, in online. I think another one, and this is where I used to have a tax practice and, you know, because of the work I've regardless, but my tax um, clients, I would get tons of calls about um, government impersonation schemes. Yes. Gosh, the IRS. The IRS. Out to me. I go, the IRS is not reaching out to you. you they no, do Josh, not text you. The lady <laughs> called me. Believe me. She told, I go, no. She goes, Josh, look at the email. I go, that's not the IRS. Number one thing I want to explain yeah, for everyone please, listening please to Please tell this. everyone this. The IRS is one of the most antiquated computer systems. They're still running computer mainframe from the Kennedy administration in there. <gasps> you will get a letter from the Internal Revenue Service. A letter in the mail. Email? Eh, phone call? Especially a phone call like, you know with a block number, right? Like, and if you do get a phone call, please send me a letter. Oh, we did send you a letter. Great. Send it to me again and we can set up an appointment. My point is, you know, they're muscling you and putting the United States IRS or the Social Security Administration or the Mortgage of America Association Yes. Right. And yeah. they will they will continue to do it. They will mass themselves as your banker. They will yes. call. They will be your banker. We are calling from Bank of America. I don't go. I'm not with Bank of America. Click. We we are. They'll just keep calling. Right. And right. there's neighborhoods. Florida's easy, man. Like you can look at zip codes and, you know, just pull in the yellow book and I can go through certain zip codes and I can target because somebody uses Bank of America. Somebody uses Wells Fargo. And Did then once we do book? that, yeah, <laughs> you got to understand, you know, I, I, I don't think Americans just don't understand how, how far $500 can go in the Philippines or in Southeastern Asia, or That's they can go true. in the Eastern European bloc, right? Like oh, wow, the Eastern yeah. European bloc has a lot of technological fraudsters out there and they're very, very sophisticated and 50 us dollars <laughs> can go a very, very long way, not just for a person, but multiple persons. And, and and you know, Emily, that's where technology becomes the issue. Is it's it's not just your backdoor person that can stab you. You can be hit from a lot of different places. Yeah, and even you know, you mentioned um, you know we're talking about the mail and how the IRS will always mail you a letter, but you know, even with the mail, you, you know, that I get when I do an estate plan for someone, for instance, and we retitle their home into their revocable trust. Well, then a deed is recorded for that. Well, there are companies out there that then send a letter. It happens every single time to every client. They send a letter saying, you need to pay me so I can get you a certified copy of your deed. And it's very confusing and very looks very official, you know, and they think it's from the property appraiser or some other government, you know, entity, but it never is. It's just a, a scheme where, you know, mm -hmm. someone is trying to get you to pay them to give you something that you shouldn't have to pay for. So anyway, um, even with the whenever mail, anyone asks in I got to give credit to my father-in-law on this one, but whenever anyone asks me to pay something, I always go, why and how much? <laughs> and you'd be surprised. I, I don't care if we're, you know, my father-in-law, he'll do it if we're at Target. Um, I, hopefully the point doesn't get lost. When I go and check out at Target as well. <laughs> Question it. What? Why? No. I'm How not paying, you dollars? know, <laughs> just don't hand over your money. But, you know, listen, unfortunately, it's going to continue to happen. I think, you know, having segments like this that talk about it, uh, you know, it, for your listeners, I talked about the Association of Certified Fraud Examiners. Yes. I think the Federal Trade Commission 
also has some really good resources. And we can um, put those think, links on our website for you guys who are listening. Uh, another, another organization that I'm familiar with that deals a lot with elders is the Association of Family and Conciliatory Courts, um, Florida AFCC. Um, and they, they help a lot with elder abuse and, and that's, um, individuals that are looking, you know, for advocating for their rights and it's mental health professionals along with attorneys. Oh, well, that's um, great. Yeah. That's a great yeah. resource. So thank you. We'll yeah. put that on our, on our website, um, for you guys as a resource, if you have more, um, questions about that. And if you're just tuning in, we are talking about elder fraud today with Josh Schultz, and this is the Elder Law Hour with Emily Hicks. So let's get into how you can protect yourself. What, I mean, we talked about just being proactive. Um, You know, I never want to go online again after this conversation, Josh. (laughs) So, you know, what, what can we, um, what else can we do to make sure that we're protected? Is there any kind of software or anything that you may recommend other than just having a trusted friend or family member sort of watching over your, your shoulder or what do you, um, what do you suggest? Stay offline? <laughs> no, I mean, listen, that's how I would avoid financial attraction transactions online unless it's completely necessary. Gotcha. Um, I think that if I am going to do a financial transaction online, there's only certain company websites that I'm comfortable doing with it, right? Obviously, Amazon at this point. Please say Amazon. (laughs) Yeah, absolutely. But, you know, um, am I cognizant of it, right? Do I review those charges? I do. Um, I I just, you know, and I have a 13-year-old daughter. I have four kids, but one of them, I have a 13-year-old daughter. So when she wants to go and buy some piece of clothing and my wife and I are looking like, what is that website? Yeah. We're just not buying it there. Right. Yes. Like I'm not just slapping my debit card information onto some website just because type of a situation, right. even if that's the only place we can get that shoe or that purse or whatever it may be. And that holds true for myself. Like, you know, I like yeah. to buy stuff, believe it or not. Um, but, You know, I'm a big golfer, but I don't, I get pop-up ads for that stuff. So I really try and limit, like, what do I need and why am I buying it on online? I think secondarily then, too, is, you know, if you are a senior, I would hopefully you have a CPA, you have a financial advisor, advisor, you have an estate planning attorney, somebody who you can meet with on an annual basis. Right. And I would say in those annual meetings, and it's not necessarily the professionals, but is there a checklist of items that you should be doing? That's probably the time of year when you're pulling together your tax return information. So you know yeah. what? While you're doing that, take a look at the last three months of your bank statements. Take a look at what what cards am I using? What is the list of bank uh, and debit cards? What's the list of credit cards? What mortgages do I have or debts do I have? Do you have a complete listing of your assets and your liabilities and the actual checking account number? Do you have that? Do you if, know? Do you just have a list of that? If and they work with me, point, I make them have it. <laughs> yeah, but how many don't Hopefully I can't make point. them. But yeah, and absolutely. So, and, and you know, people come to me and they probably come to you, Emily, for different types of things. So in that annual checkup, you know, is it a good time to pull a credit report? Maybe, right? Like, yeah. why not? I've never done it. Well, you're going to go meet with a CPA. So guess what? That's another thing in addition that I would just check off the box, yeah. right? And, and then once you've done that, understand what your portfolio, your estate looks like, and then sit down and make sure you have the right protections. And There's different types of protections. There's preventive controls. There's like what software to not allow people to hack into it. And those are good, right? Having a a lock on your door is a very good preventive control. Not using the internet is a good preventive control. But there's also detective controls. Doing a monthly bank reconciliation still seems to be the best way to find fraud. 
for business yeah. owners of their cash. Right. Tried and true, a monthly bank rec still, even at the largest organizations in the world, can find out if somebody is stealing or not. Um, and so I, I would just tell people that there's detective things. And w- it, just like it's good practice to sit down with a CPA, to sit down with an estate of planning attorney for those types of things, you can add on to those meetings to get as much out of it right and then use sure. that as a point to do some you know when emily you're you're sitting with your clients talking about let's dust off the estate plan let's take a look at this what's changed look at your portfolio and, and, and do some of those types of things just to make sure right yeah absolutely i mean it's prevention is worth a a pound of cure, right? So yeah, yeah, but you're not going to be able to prevent things. But you know, if you can detect, listen, just like you when you're a senior, you go to the the, the annual. You know, my dad bitches. He goes three years and now three times a year now, and they call it you know preventive medicine, and they're yeah. trying to detect things early on. Basically, right. financial fraud should be the same thing, right? That's I think depending that's depending on analogy. and then depending on who you are what you own, what you transact, there are different risks that are going to hit you potentially. I have clients that have 10, $20 million estates and they've lost money in those real estates. Okay. So don't think that it's just, you know, $50 or $500. It comes in all different sizes and shapes. Okay. So let's move on to talk a little bit about the economy and is this right josh are there a thousand people moving to florida every day because that sounds like a lot of people <laughs> and so here's you, know, you're, here's you being funny. from south florida you're used to it but us be, us from north floridians and we are like what's happening the past couple of years um so what kind of um what what's this doing to our economy? You know, uh, you mentioned you know fraud is becoming more rampant and things like that. There's a lot of influx of um, just a lot of different people in the area. Um, Jacksonville hasn't really seen this type of growth. Um, so how is that? Um, how's that affecting us with the economy? So I've heard that stat too. Um, and definitely, if you look around Northeast Florida, your neighbors look probably different, especially if you're in. St. John's County, Nassau, Clay County, sure. things are changing. And definitely in Duval, too, in places, right? I see yeah. it. Um, you see it on the highways, right? There's another statistic, though, too, along with that 1,000 people in. Our um, birth rate is is not as high as the death rate. So yeah. our population is aging. Is yeah. aging. So we have an aging population on top of more people coming in. It's becoming an older. And some of the services that we talked about are less and less just because there's less of it. So from an economic standpoint, if I'm an outside fraudster in the eastern block of wherever, northeast Florida looks like a pretty good place to start shooting over, you know, little um, uh, uh, whatever I got it, snail mails, uh, whatever they want to call it. That's a good place to look at. Yeah. So our economy, and you look at who's moving here, not just like, and I understand the fear of, look, we have people coming from outside places that are different. And I'm going to, yeah, the sophisticated, the financial sophistication is changing in Jacksonville. It's part of the reason I decided to stay in Jacksonville as opposed to go back to it. I saw it. Did I think it would happen as quick as it did? No. Uh, COVID sped things up much faster and has changed things much faster than I thought. Mm -hmm. But on top of that is the accumulation of wealth. So with retirees comes people with bigger bank accounts, right? And so the service providers go, oh, look, there's an opportunity. I can provide more service. So, So can fraudsters. So our economy... The fact that we're getting older, the fact that there's more money that's coming into our local economy, um, the fact that there is a need for development and opportunity and investments. That's why I bring up, you know, Emily, where are we putting, you know, 
I want, how many times have you sat down with a client? Oh, everything I have, I work for, I want to leave it to my kids. Oh, that's great. And then the next thing you know, well, because they wanted to do something good for their kids, they decided to invest it in their kid and their kid's friend or into this. And now it's gone. Right. That concerns me. I would also say this, that people are living older. That's why I, I said I struggle with elders because that sliding scale of, you know, what my grandpa and grandma used to be is different, right? Like, yeah. am I an elder? So I'm in my forties, no, 30 years. Am I going to be an elder in today's economy? I'll probably be working. Right. And, According and to my I children, I am an elder. <laughs> yeah. And I might be servicing my dad who's a hundred at that point in time too. So yeah. Yeah. all of those things are going to come into play with that being said, and with the concentration of a wealthier, older population, healthcare fraud sure. is where if I had to read the tea leaves and you said, Josh, where do you want my clients to worry about? Worry about healthcare schemes, worry about, oh, you went to a doctor and now I got this bill and now you're on the phone. So those insurance types of schemes, that's where I have concerns for your clients in that demographic. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. I haven't, I haven't thought that much about healthcare fraud, but that's a really good point because, you know, the access to services is going to be a bigger and bigger issue. Um, you know, here's we, a scheme for you too, Emily, and sorry to cut you off here, but ahead. how hard would it be for me to sit outside of Baptist and track, um, I'm just coming off, off of this track yeah. license plates and then send all that license plate information over to somewhere and have them go through DMV records. And now I get the addresses for all those people. And I put together a nice mailing that says, based upon your recent visit, you still owe us X. Oh, how many people would fall for that? You think, how hard is that for me to do to pay some kid? I don't know, a hundred bucks. I want you to sit. I'll pay you a hundred bucks to sit out here. I'll pay you a dollar for every license plate you get me. Oh gosh. Yeah. There you go. So now I'll, I'll give you a thousand dollars for that list. And then I'll take another thousand dollars and pay somebody or some kid, whatever to go in there and get me addresses. So now I'm two grand in for a thousand names. All right. So let me think about this. 200 bucks hit them up for. So 200, I have the potential to make 200,000. If I only hit on 10% of it, I've got 20 grand. That's it's crazy. Pretty good business plan, isn't it? That's actually, yes. I, I oh, that makes me um, just kind of have a little chill up my spine. <laughs> I'm in the wrong business. I know. I tell my clients all the time. It's a good thing you're fighting for the good guys and not. Uh... <laughs> And that's just me thinking about it here. So, you know, like people get desperate, you know, and, yeah. and I mean, we I'm not seeing... that smart. I tell people I'm not that smart. <laughs> well, we are seeing a lot of desperation. I mean, you know, a, a lot of people can't afford groceries, you know, nowadays. Yes. I mean, there's a lot of, there's a lot of desperation out there. There's a lot of right with medical costs. I mean, there, there's just so much that people are going through and, you know, they, don't always have the resources to pay for it. So desperation is when people get older, they get more confused. They get scared yes, because they come absolutely. from a point in time where it was much more honest and, yeah. and, and dishonesty. And listen, I grew up in South Florida, so I'm a little bit more accustomed to it because, you know, South Florida was a melting pot. You always had to kind of know to have your guard on. Yeah. Did my dad get ripped off by a landscaper? Hell yeah. Yeah. Right. Like, yeah. did a contractor screw him over at some point? Hell yeah. Yeah. Are we going to start seeing more and more of these types of things here? Hell yeah. Yeah. Um, you got to put your guard up. Right. Um, and don't automatically assume just that because so and so has been your neighbor for three decades, that they won't take advantage of that. You know right. what I mean? Yeah. Um, so, you know, it's just, it's kind of unfortunate, but, 
Yeah, it's a changing world and we just have to adapt and we have to, you know, be as prepared as we can. And unfortunately, we got to keep our guard up in more than, you know, one way. It's not like the old days. We have to protect ourselves online. We have to protect ourselves in person and of course, over the phone. So I think, you know, this has been really, really educational and really, really helpful. Um, Josh, I appreciate you being here so, so much. And if there's anything else you want to add, just let me know. Um, how, if someone, if someone has, as a business owner, because you primarily work with business owners, correct? If they would like to get individuals. Yeah, no, Uh, we uh, listen, we work with individuals, corporations, attorneys. Gotcha. Um, you can reach out to us at shiltscpa.com. Um, we service clients, uh, you know, throughout the country. Um, you know, um, and uh, unfortunately, that's where the problems are. Um, I would say this, you know, if somebody if you've been if you've been impacted by fraud, I, I would um, first and foremost, figure out how it happened and cut it off immediately. Second is call the cops, call yeah. the bank, report this type of stuff. They the banks have good consumer protection resources. They can find these people better than. Sometimes, you know, local law enforcement. Um, so you got to report it. Don't just let it go to the side. Good. That's great advice. Well, so we'll put a link to your website on the uh, website that we host the show called elderlawhour.com. And thank you again, Josh, for being here. I think this was great. Um, I thank really, you. really appreciate it. And hopefully um, you will come back and visit us soon. Would love to. Thanks a lot, Emily. This was great. I appreciate it. Thanks. I'd like to end this episode with a recent question that I got from Russ, whose father has recently gone into the nursing home for long-term care. And Russ is really concerned about the nursing home being able to take his father's home because he has heard horror stories about nursing homes or the state can take your house. Now, this is a question that I get a lot from people who are really afraid of going into nursing homes for that reason or having their loved one going into a nursing home because they think that the nursing home can then take their house. This is a really common fear that comes up because many families have actually had something like this happen to them. And the reason that they've had it happen is because when the state pays for someone's Medicaid, then that creates a debt by that person to the state. And now the state has a claim against that person's estate once they pass away. This is not going to be something that is going to affect them while they're alive. This is something that will affect their estate after they pass away. So that means that the patient in this instance owes the state money for what the state paid for through Medicaid while that person was in a nursing home, which means that if you don't have any estate planning, and you own your home in your personal name, when you die, the state can file a claim against that asset. However, the only way that the state can collect this money is by filing a claim against the person's estate in the probate process. Now, you guys hear me talk a lot about probate because there are a lot of advantages to avoiding it. And this is probably one of the biggest advantages to avoiding probate. If you have a loved one that is going into a nursing home, and qualifies for Medicaid, the state can have a claim against that estate, but will have no way to collect any of the money if there is no probate. So if you can manage to avoid probating your loved one's assets, and again, we are only talking about those who are in a nursing home and on Medicaid for long-term care, then you won't have anything to lose. The only way to recover the money by the state, again, is to filing, is filing a claim against someone's estate in probate. So if your home is owned in your trust, or perhaps it's jointly titled with someone else, or maybe you have a ladybird deed that was done, and that's a very common method for avoiding probate when you own a home. But I will just caution you that not all ladybird deeds are created equal. So make sure you're using an experienced attorney that knows the proper way to create that deed. And an experienced elder law attorney will know what language you will need to have in that deed. But it's another way that you can avoid this happening. So to answer your question, Russ, yes, there is a way that the state can possibly have a claim against your father's house, but only if he has assets left in his personal name that go through probate. 
So make sure that you do as much as you can ahead of time to get everything titled properly so that doesn't happen. I hope this has been helpful for you and please contact your elder law attorney so that you can get a better idea of what you need to do because Medicaid planning is complex and each asset has very specific rules. So make sure that you have a good plan in place. So I want to thank you for listening to the episode of the Elder Law Hour today. I thought Josh was a great guest and I certainly learned so much about fraud and how we can prevent that happening to us or our loved ones. And if you'd like to connect with me or learn more about today's episode, please visit us at the at elderlawhour.com. I'm Emily Hicks and we will catch you next week. Thank you for tuning in to the Elder Law Hour with Emily Hicks. Join us this and every Saturday for the Elder Law Hour with Emily Hicks, right here on WBOB.